Welcome back to the Michael Brooks Show. Joining us now is Kianga Yamada Taylor. She is author from Black Lives to Black Liberation and author of another book forthcoming. Kianga, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you and glad to be here. So I, we want to get uh, definitely to the books soon and everybody should be reading your books as well as your column. I mean, I primarily read you in the Jacobin, but people can find mm -hmm. your writing many different places. You've um, endorsed Bernie Sanders um, in a way that I think makes a lot of conversations that get very abstracted and kind of disconnected, I guess, both from like a sort of radical outside position of politics, if we're going to mm -hmm. put it that way, and also from mm -hmm. a sort of like programmatic, we're dealing in the kind of relative realities of where we are. These these arguments get kind of mushed up and the, you know, this, I, I think it's kind of a false question of revolution or reform. And my read of your endorsement is that you're kind of calling into question that dichotomy too. Am I reading that right? And why have you endorsed Bernie Sanders so strongly? Well, I don't, I don't think that you can get to one without the other. Um, meaning that any discussion of revolution um, or a radical transformation uh, what Martin Luther King referred to or described as a radical reconstruction of American society. You can't do that without um, engaging in some uh, process of reform, um, which is to say you can't go from the kind of ineptitude and corruption that our society is mired in today to a complete and total transformation with no uh, reform efforts along the way. And so the way that I look at it is that reforms and re reform struggle, and in some sense you could say every battle to make life better in our society today is a reform struggle, that those are necessary to deal with people's day-to-day -day, uh, lives, the issues that people confront on a daily basis. But it's also the process by which people learn how to struggle the way this is the way that politics develops. This is the way that strategies and tactics and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. Um, those all develop through the course of uh, the struggle around reforms. Um, and that that's a process that can't go on into perpetuity. Um, it's at some point there um, has to be a break with what is existing or what is happening um, today. But even that, it, it's not an act of God. It's not an act of uh, nature. It's a political um, intervention, a conclusion that people come to, um, namely through their struggles around reform issues, um, that there's something fundamentally broken uh, in this uh, society as it's currently constituted. I mean, in the, in the 1930s and the 1960s, this is how reformists or liberals became radicals and revolutionaries, was the constant um, uh, uh, disappointing engagement with the political establishment and the status quo and the ability to, uh, you know, move two steps forward and move two steps back um, and the frustration and realization uh, that it wasn't enough, in fact, to struggle around reforms, that um, society, in the same way that King uh, came to the conclusion that society had to be completely uh, uh, and fundamentally um, reorganized. And so I think that that is a process that, um, you know, a, a certain section of our society is undergoing uh, right now. I think that is part of what I would describe as a political radicalization or political awakening, awakening that has been happening in fits and starts in the United States really um, since the, the, the fallout of the um, uh, Obama candidacy in 2008 that gave way to Occupy, uh, that eventually gave way to uh, the development uh, of the Black Lives Matter movement um, that reflected uh, the kinds of contradictions and tensions that appeared in the 
uh, Arab Spring that was uh, we saw some of in the the, the Capitol battle um, in Madison, Wisconsin, um, and that ultimately has given rise to the candidacy um, of, of Bernie Sanders first in 2016 uh, and much more emphatically um, this time around. And so, you know, I look at the, the Sanders campaign as uh, really a once in a lifetime opportunity um, in this uh, country to have a self-described uh, socialist, uh, democratic socialist, uh, socialist nonetheless, um, in the highest office in this country, giving voice to this demand that our government use its public money to do something more than cause war, mayhem, and destruction, that we use the public treasure to actually improve the lives of people um, in this country. I am under no illusion that a President Bernie Sanders can be elected on a Tuesday and show up, uh, you know, a couple of months later um, and just present the Congress with a list of demands. Um, but I think that Sanders is aware of that as well. And that is what is at the heart of the uh, discussion about the political revolution. It's the understanding that there has to be a grassroots component um, to his uh, uh, candidacy to make any of this real. And that, to me, is one of the key uh, differences um, between the Sanders campaign um, and a Warren campaign. Elizabeth Warren says she has a plan um, for everything. But if you think that all you need is a, is a plan and a uh, well-mapped-out um, uh, a policy initiative to get anything passed in the, the the horrible U.S. Congress, you're out of your mind. I mean, this is what the essence of 21st century class warfare uh, looks like in the U.S. It looks like a Congress that has a Senate that is dominated by millionaires. The average wealth of a U.S. senator is $3 million. The average wealth of a member of the House of Representatives is something like $990,000. So we have a, a Congress made up of millionaires, and we have a billionaire president right now. So if you think that all you need is a plan to undo that kind of class privilege and the way that they wield it to their benefit and to the detriment to the rest of us, then you're not really paying attention to what, what is happening. Um, and I think that Sanders' emphasis on the grassroots uh, uh, movement that is necessary to push through this agenda um, is, is, for me, it's the right understanding of how uh, an electoral campaign um, can work together with tension and all of that, but can work together uh, with a grassroots movement. But I do think that his campaign um, marks an important breakthrough uh, for the sort of, you know, the burgeoning socialist movement um, in this country, and that he's not only an expression um, of what I've described as a political radicalization, um, but he is also giving it a framework and language to understand uh, why people are struggling to make ends meet, um, who the real enemy is, that it's not black people, it's not immigrants, um, you know, it's Amazon, it's Jeff Bezos, it's the people uh, who are in charge of this economy. And I think, you know, it's been... I mean, I, I just I just think the, the breakthrough that the Sanders campaign uh, represents has really been understated by the mainstream media uh, in the in the U.S., um, if not ignored. Um, people just, you know, they talk about Bernie Sanders as, you know, some guy who just hasn't had the same message over uh, and over again, as if the point is to be entertaining people um, and not talking to people. There's not about, enough innovation uh, he hasn't updated yeah, it. You got. You got to. I. I. Alyssa, I have to say. Conversation. You know. I, I agree. I couldn't agree more. I. I remember somebody kind of accosting me recently and trying to tell me that the problem with Bernie was that he didn't understand something called financial capitalism, which is apparently a new thing that has not existed mm -hmm. before. And I was like. You mean yeah, that, like we have ATMs yeah. or derivatives trading now? And they were like, no, 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 you don't. Yeah, you're stuck too. 
I was like, I am absolutely <laughs> stuck because I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Um, the, <laughs> but do you think actually, I think that's actually a really important kind of thing to spell out. There's in the Democratic primary right now, the, the thing that's very easy, I think, to identify for a lot of people is the, you know, what Joe Biden represents at the most just extreme on every level, which is just this decades of right wing, corporate, third way, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, but then there's this very for some people, it's subtle, but it's actually like a significant chasm between a message that is saying the only way that this could even first of all, that the only way that this could even have a prayer of working, something like delivering health care to every human being in this country is with a absolutely radicalized and angry part of the population mobilized uh, versus a, I kind of get that this is really bad. It reminds me of the financial times pages, right? Like there's some people who are like, you know what? We are really hurting people so much that they're going to get a little bit angry. So we really should give them more, but without any of putting power into play and it's liberal and progressive, but there's no power in play. No, absolutely. Um, I think in some ways it's, you know, it's the difference between having an actual analysis of, of the problem along with a plan for how to confront it, whether or not the, the, the plan in the end uh, works. It's just a different kind of conversation compared to what someone like Biden is selling, which is essentially, um, I'm electable. I think I can, you know, I can beat Trump and I don't have much to offer uh, beyond that. Um, And I think that the, you know, his campaign has tried to hide him um, by not having him speak publicly, because I think that we've all seen that um, Joe Biden is probably his worst enemy. Every time he opens his mouth, his poll numbers begin uh, to decline. And that at this point, what he's running on is name recognition. Um, And I think that the polarization that has been created by the Trump administration um, has really foreclosed uh, a lot of the the space of the political center. It's not to say that um, the center is completely dead, uh, but the kind of mealy mouth, um, sound bite, political fluff, the typical third grade discourse we're used to during election season um, is not enough. Is not enough. People are actually looking uh, for something to vote for. Um, and not to just vote against. And I think that we saw that the kind of uh, strategy of, you know, America's already great, we just need to make it better, that was at the center of Hillary Clinton's campaign, is not enough. And the the, the idea that it is is to really miss uh, the kind of, of suffering that is happening in this country that in some ways has been easily covered up by uh, just looking at economic numbers. Oh, the, you know, growth is at uh, 3%. What problems? We have no problems. Unemployment is at a historical low. We have no problems. Uh, And then it's ignoring other factors which have to do with the quality of life. Not that you are in abject poverty uh, uh, and homeless, even though we have a great lot of that um, and numbers that appear uh, to, to be going up around that. But what is the quality of your job? What is the quality of your uh, uh, health insurance? If you have health insurance um, at all, how much debt are you carrying with you? I mean, these are the, the deeper questions that lie beyond uh, or beneath the kind of happy talk um, about the uh, economy. And that is really part of what is driving um, this historical interest in uh, socialism um, in the 21st century. 
And and I think that's such an important point to underline because it, it actually gave, and this was, an, I think that di- it's a little bit different this time, obviously, because Trump can't just sort of bloviate. He has his own record and he obviously has done nothing to change any of these problems, although that means he will be even deeper on the xenophobia and right. the racism. But I think that was so revealing in 2016 because there was the sort of fact check mindset that would say like, oh, well, you know, what Trump said about the economy isn't true. Things are great. And I was like, well, no, right. he's specifically going to places in the country where it's absolutely horrible. And you're completely divorced from that, even if you're sort of quantitatively correct in a way that has nothing to do with real people's yep. lives. Yep. Yeah, I mean, there there are some really shocking um, numbers that defy the, uh, you know, the 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 bright spots of the the so-called bright spots of the economy. Um, one of the the more shocking ones, like you know, black people are 12 percent of the U.S. population, and yet uh, black people make up 40 percent. Uh, of homeless people. That's one. Um, Already great. I think, yeah, I know, I know, exactly. Um, I mean, to to use that as as a slogan in the midst of uh, what at that point was the Black Lives Matter movement is absurd. I mean, it's it's, the two make no sense uh, together coming from a Democratic Party uh, candidate. But even among ordinary white people, um, for working class white people, uh, life expectancy has gone into reverse, uh, meaning that working class white men and women are dying earlier um, than they were previously. And it should just be emphasized that this does not happen in the developed world. Um, right. There are almost no examples in the developed world of life expectancy going into reverse outside of some kind of natural calamity. And yet that is exactly what is happening in the United States. And it's being fueled by opioid addiction, alcoholism, and suicide. Uh, And these are hardly the markers of a happy days are here again uh, economy and society. And so I think that if we look beneath, we can see some of the factors that are driving uh, the sense of cynicism about politics, which means that the typical uh, sound bites don't work, that people are looking for substance, they're looking for an actual uh, alternative. Um, and it also explains the, uh, the political um, search for an even broader explanation uh, for why this is happening and something that explains the mismatch between what we are told is a, the, the, the wonders of the market and the wonders of capitalism and what is actually happening in people's lives. Because if this stuff is happening now, when things are supposed to be great, <laughs> when there's economic growth, when there's historically low unemployment, well, then what the hell happens when the bottom falls out and we have spent the last 20 years destroying any semblance of an economic safety net in a, in a country that has already had a notoriously anemic social welfare state, what on earth will happen then? And people, regular people think about this all the time because they are living from paycheck to paycheck. So even though these people don't show up, in the, the statistics of, you know, abject poverty, homelessness, they don't show up there, but they know that they're one or two paychecks away from there. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, everybody.